Hello, hello everyone. So today I have Gernot, I'm going to mispronounce your name, Schwenter, Schwentner with me, um, who's one of the co-founders of We Grow Company, um, which basically helps SaaS companies enter the global markets or conversely enter the local markets if they want to drill down and become more relevant in a particular you know, market. This is a very, very hot topic, right? Because, well, as we know, the global English speaking market is becoming more and more saturated. It's more and more competitive. It's more and more difficult to stand out. So finally, such companies are recognizing the need to pay more attention to the local markets. Is that how you feel about it as well, Colonel? Absolutely right. Uh, thanks, Emilia, and, and great to, to be here today. Thanks for inviting me. Um, Global expansion, I think, is for every startup and for every SaaS company, for every tech company, essentially one of the biggest hurdles, but also one of the most uh, exciting things that you can do. Your solution will potentially change the world, right? There are so many problems out there that still needs to be solved. Software will mainly so solve that or have a huge contribution to it. And then it's uh, just key how will you reach all the people and all the companies in the world and um, do this in a very efficient and, and good way. Exactly. Right. And um, it's not just about language. We'll get to that. Right. We talked to the CEO of Foley who launched initially in Poland and moved to the US a while ago. And she found out that the US customers want a completely different product, essentially, like different features. So we'll get to that. But first, tell us a little, a little bit more about yourself. Like, you know, where are you based? Um, when did you start the company? Why, right? Like, how did you come up with this idea? Yeah. So my name is Gernot, um, co-founder, CEO of WeGrow International. So that's the company that my co-founder Florent and I created our back in uh, 2017. And how, how did it come to that? Um, we were both part of tech startups uh, scaling internationally. There was one in specific that we were both part in, and that's how we know each other and had got the idea to found this company. We scaled super fast. This was like expansion on steroids almost. Uh, we scaled from 100 to 750 people in one year. We, were, we opened 17 markets in total, um, and this was lots of fun, uh, pure madness sometimes, really good energy, um, but unfortunately, it didn't end well. So we had to, after a while, one and a half years later, we had to uh, cut half of the markets, put uh, 200 plus people on the street from one day to another. And we almost ran out of funding. And this was really one of the awakening moments and also birthplaces of what we do now because um, internationalization has played a very important role there. Very frustrating experience that I had there. I've hired so many cool people. And then I had to let go a lot of them. And um, we turned that frustration around and said, this should not happen to any other tech founder or to any other founder and any other company. What can we do? Fast forward, we created WeGrow uh, with the aim to help and impact founders and companies out there in their global expansion journey to have a positive impact. And that's what we do since, since day one. And uh, we've worked so far, I think, with 350 plus companies. Uh, so every year we help around 80 to 100 different startups and scale-ups all over the place, uh, be it in Europe, in the US, sometimes in Asia, Latin America, um, to make this really bulletproof uh, because it is a bloody, bloody hard process, very complex. Um, and we're happy to share our experience, our learnings, our network. Um, we're now I think 15, 14 or 15 different nationalities just in our core team. So you can imagine it's it's lots of, lots of fun um, to, to work in such an international company while having also the personal satisfaction. I can help other companies to grow while growing our company and doing this all in an international environment. Yeah, wow. That's, that's a big story right like I can't help myself but you know ask you this question which kind of leads me to my next question how we grow helps SaaS companies um exactly you know like what, what happened and how do you now because you mentioned you are now like translating this knowledge into the service that you provide at we grow right mm -hmm. so like you know what is the service exactly and what was this learning that you took 
out yeah. from this experience? So basically how we add value to SaaS companies is on three big topics. Um, quickly, quickly tell you the three topics. Uh, one is market related and I'm going to dive into in a second. The second one is um, talents. So we also help with finding great talents for the expansion, the country managers, the head of sales, head of marketing for the new territories. And then uh, we also help on capital, fundraising, M&A projects or other things that can also help you to grow and fuel your international expansion. In the market part, it's, it's very clear how we help SaaS companies. And I turn it around, what are the most common questions that we get, right? And, and that's how we build our services. One is, are we ready to grow globally and internationally? A lot of founders just, just run, go ahead. And I'm, I'm a founder myself, so I, I never want to break that energy. But it's good to be aware, what are your blind spots? Maybe on a product level, maybe on a team level, maybe on a strategy level, um, et cetera. So, we map that out to a quick check to see how ready they are for international expansion, what is missing, big construction sites, how can you fill them in order not to, to scale your problems. The second one is which markets should you actually double down uh, because resources are always scarce. For any startup, even scale ups, even if there's a lot of funding, resources are always scarce. So where can you focus? Which markets make sense? Which tier areas? Doesn't mean that you can be open up uh, globally, but where do you really narrow down and gain traction? We help to make them understand the local product market fit. I think the example that you just shared before, going from Poland to the US, you need to mm. adjust your product. This is always the leading thought. And we combine then those things into a clear go-to-market plan. Mm -hmm. Develop canvases, plans for all of that have uh, tons of playbooks in place. And I think what makes us really unique is we can also help to execute it. So we're not just on a strategic plan making level, but we go two levels deeper, roll up our sleeves, and then we execute it. And that's where we have the most fun uh, seeing the, the actual results um, while growing a company, helping them with the right steps and building also the organization in the background that can um, support that process of uh, global scaling, international expansion. I think that's also equally important. So that's how we help SaaS companies. Um, we've learned a lot over the, the last years. Uh, SaaS companies are a big chunk of the business that we do, of the projects that we do. So very often we actually make interconnections between our uh, clients and they help each other for different territories or with different leads. So that's also an added benefit that they will have uh, while working with us. Cool. So you partially answered my next question, right? Like what does internationalization actually mean for, you know, a SaaS yeah. company? Um, if you were to give us like a quick checklist of, you know, top things that SaaS companies need to remember in their go-to-market strategy. Yeah, product market fit is always leading. Um, then it takes double the time and double the money that you think it will. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is this is a good rule of thumb to have top of mind. So make a good plan for that and, and also allocate budget for it. Work with locals as much as possible because otherwise um, any, any misspelling, any typo or any th word that is not used in the right way, um, I think is a huge conversion killer and trust killer. So work with locals. And I think any SaaS company is meant to be global. So um, dom strive for market leadership, strive for global domination, even if you will not make it in the first or in the second year, but it sets your mind to it. While having said that, focus also on some core markets where you can really gain traction because this will then help you to uh, attract new funding and not spread your resources too thin and not make progress anywhere. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I had um, on that note, had an interesting conversation with a founder that was actually running out of funding and that was, you know, already laying off people because of that. And he's like, we need to move into the US, right? One of the investors told us we need to launch on the US market. That's our last chance. I'm like, you don't even have money for that, right? <laughs> like, exactly. You don't even have product for that. And interestingly, it was um, it was a very local product. It was related to education, right? It was like this semi-automated teaching assistant, right? That would help you solve maths 
problems, but the maths problems were, of course, based on the local curriculum, right? So imagine now localizing a product like that on a shoestring budget on That's a huge it. competitive market. And yeah. I think you're naming already a lot of those mm. uh, topics that we often hear, right? So there's a huge mm. ambition, there's a huge aspiration level, um, how, how founders and how they want to grow their companies. But then the proof is in the pudding. Right and, and making a good plan really helps. Um, and what we often see is there's a huge gap between ambition and then actually what is possible right now. What can you really do? Um, which markets can you really launch? And product market fit is always leading. So it's 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 what you said, like such a product um, localizing and, and changing that also from a proposition level that takes time. That takes actually deep, deep, deep uh, involvement on the tech and product level mm -hmm. to change that. It's the same, like, I always bring it in a different context. McDonald's, in most of the countries, they have a different recipe for a local burger or those mm -hmm. kind of things, right? Mm -hmm. So we all understand that, that you will have a certain burger in India versus France versus uh, Sweden or the UK. And then you have a base level that is the same price, for example, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you need to localize your product because then you have a pull effect into the market. People love your product. Otherwise, you need to buy market and that's, yeah, or educate the market so that that's, uh, yeah, costly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we touched a little bit upon the common mistakes, right? And, you know, going global, international. Yeah, I wanted to kind of expand on that a little bit. What are the most frequent mistakes that you see and what are the challenges, you know, in the um, expansion process that also you as part of WeGrow face with your, yeah. with your clients? So it um, challenge is always understanding the local market. Mm -hmm. We all know, like the country that we were born, we spend a lot of time, we tend to just, just understand, we get the nuances, we, we, we kind of sucked it up with, with the mother milk, if, if, if I may mm -hmm. say in a way, right, that we know things uh, within that market that become so normal, how do you conduct a meeting, how to greet people, how to respect formalities, and I'm saying all that because those things are really important in the sales process, right, with whom to talk in an organization, but also, um, yeah, what do people want actually in terms of product and why other products won't work in that market. So a lack of local knowledge is really something that um, is a common thread through all our our expansion projects how can you know all those things if you've never lived there that's where we come in so we have uh, all those different nationalities on board and then we have around 100 experts that we can pull in from different geo areas that can make make you understand the local market how does it behave is it worth going there yes or no we set up uh, validation uh, tracks and experiments to de-risk also that expansion step and just narrow down also on a, on a clear numeric and data level, which markets make actually sense to research further. Um, so that, that's one, understanding the local market, not well enough, um, being too hasty and too fast in the expansion. Um, as I said, those steps, getting ready where to go and then making a plan and then launching. Um, you can run them in parallel, but you have to run through them. So classic founder mistake. And again, I'm a founder myself, very impatient person that you're talking to right now, but you're already in the execution mode. Mentally, I'm already there in those markets. So um, you, you might open markets that are not worth opening. And then you hire people and then suddenly you don't have any traction um, in those markets because you didn't do your research and your preparation properly. That can cost you your company. I've seen it. I've been part of a company uh, where it went really wrong. And in the end, the company went bankrupt um, because of many things. But also this, I think, was one of the root causes. Um, so... The, I think that's another another challenge uh, that SaaS companies run into, and just um, thinking, okay, we can have our product all over the world, and then let's see what happens. Um, and and spreading the resources a bit too thin, if there is a more high touch sales um, involved, and also then customer success and later um, service level, um, yeah. then then suddenly you have to operate in the US and in Australia and be maybe a, a, a company that is uh, situated in Europe. 
that's hard if you're only 25 people. Um, somebody has to sleep, right? Yeah. Um, so solution, there are solutions for everything, but ideally you, you can focus uh, your resources and take the right steps. Yeah, what you mentioned about the service level is super important, especially in the globalized world now, right? I see it very often that companies kind of attack different markets also in terms of just sales outreach and then they don't have any people operating in this time zone and for instance i had someone very you know um who was very like cavalier in booking my calendar at 10 30 p.m my time and like insisting we have a short discovery call and i'm like i don't think at that time i'm sorry like how would you feel if i booked your calendar at 4 a.m your time right so yeah, yeah, I guess these are the things that a lot of people don't think about. It's not just translating the website, right? Um, translating the interface, but what about the service level? What about the customer support? What about customer success, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, especially in markets where English is not that ubiquitous, right? Exactly. And, and this is where we touch on also on the organization level, right? Mm -hmm. Who do you need to hire at what time? How do you build the organization? Um, you said the US before, as a founder, do I have to move there for a year? Maybe is my organization ready? You know, who keeps keeps my back uh, free? Mm -hmm. All those kind of things. So we always look at it from, from two angles, one eye on which markets and the other one, how do you build the organization to support that? And then the third one would be, okay, how do you get the funding there to support all that? Uh, but that's a different topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've been talking a bit about PMF and that's kind of a catchphrase in the SaaS and startup world in general, right? Because that's notoriously hard to define and pinpoint. I hear people a lot say a lot, you know, like, do we have PMF? Do we not have PMF? Right? How do we assess that? So how do we grow, you know, come up with a plan, you know, for reaching that PMF on a new market, right? Mm -hmm. Product market fit. Um, and yeah, like, how, how do you do that? I give you an example because I think that's the easiest and um, to make it really tangible. Right now, we're working for a big US uh, corporation, US company that is uh, scaling internationally. Um, in the US, they're, they're king. They're really good. They're really, really grown up there. But in Europe, they don't fully understand the market yet. But they're aware of it. This is really good. So that's why we are on board. We help them to understand European markets. And what we did then is we looked at a broader range of potential addressable markets because they already had some customers in the UK, some in France, some in Germany, some in the Netherlands. So a bit scattered all over the place, no clear direction which ones would yield the most. So we analyzed those markets. And then the next thing that we did is we launched experiments in two or three of those markets, validation tracks to understand really the local product market fit, PMF. What do buyers need to see in that product? How do you have to adjust the value proposition? Uh, what are reasons for someone not to buy that product? Uh, how long does a, a decision cycle take, even if it's, especially if it's more towards enterprise sales, all those kind of things, then we put together and then we see, is there anything that you need to change in your product in order to achieve product market fit and also in your go to market approach, um, because a lot of things you can proactively address, right, um, if, if, the, if you hear what are the obstacles or challenges in the market. Or maybe you have to highlight that in your sales pitch or in your marketing material to actively address that, touch basically the core of the people in that market, and then you have an in, then they, they will start loving your product. And you will see this in, in conversion rates or in the sales velocity and how long does it take you to sign up your first customers. Um, so this really helps uh, to understand that market. That's what we can do. And then later on, it's also about really getting the first clients in. So um, creating trust in the market, mm. um, especially if it's uh, if you sell towards uh, larger companies um, in the B2B world, then have your lighthouse customers in the market that kind of radiate the trust. So if you work with that company, well, then the rest of the market will follow. Mm. Gotcha. Interesting. So like, can you recall your most successful versus most challenging um, expansion project and like, especially in SaaS? Yeah, I think one of the most successful or let me put it like um, most fun project and, and 
most of them are really fun because we learn a lot, we can have impact. But I recall one in particular because it was one of our first clients back in the days. Um, so we're based in Amsterdam, Berlin, mm -hmm. Paris, Europe, and have partners all over the world. But this one was with a Berlin-based company um, in HR tech, SaaS, SaaS by now. And the founder had tried expansion. One market for them worked, another one didn't at all. Mm -hmm. And he was very humble because he just got big funding around on board uh, for the further expansion steps. And the, he realized that he actually, or the organization was not fully ready. They needed um, people, more people that understood that topic. Well, enter WeGrow, that's how we got to them. And, um, and we started working together. And it was just really fun working with them because very agile way, we had the chance to upskill one of their employees to the new head of international. So a person, right-hand person to the CEO and founder. Also again, a lot of far side of the founder who said like, I cannot do it all by myself, but I have a very talented person next to me. Can you help that person to get up and running? The person became then the head of international and we ran that project um, for, for many months, helped them to enter a couple of markets. We helped them find uh, the first country manager uh, in, in Vienna, in this case, in, in, in my home market. So this was uh, very satisfying for myself um, mm -hmm. and lots of fun to see. And um, no, they're still growing. Excellent. So why weren't they ready? What was the... Well, they, they went to, for example, to some markets were having very, very strong competitive field there. Mm. So their product was actually not ready. Um, so they could not compete with some local uh, competitors. So technically, they had to go to other markets first. And also their organization had to learn how to internationalize. They were very focused on their home market, being Germany, big European market, mm. right? Right. big enough European market to be busy with that and the rest of the organization was with some exceptions just just not focused on it um, they, they've been educated and socialized just to to get things going on the German market so their awareness was not there and we helped to create that and um, it's it's almost like a change process sometimes in an organization so you have you have to get the people on board make them excited because expansion is per se one of the most exciting things for growth in in your in your SaaS company yeah so you mentioned kind of like it was both the most successful and the most challenging in a way yeah exactly <laughs> cool yeah you mentioned like well they weren't ready and you know it's interesting because in some markets you may like have lower standards right in some markets you may have higher standards in terms of like the accepted go-to product right for, for a particular use case or solution. Um, on the other hand, some markets may be more price sensitive, others less price sensitive, right? Yeah. So it's like a balance of all these different factors. So, you know, is there like a benchmark when the company is ready for expansion? Like, do you sometimes tell your clients, hey guys, no, <laughs> you're just not ready for this. We're not taking this project. Yeah, we do. And I think it's very healthy also toward, mm -hmm. towards them. And, and then we help them to get ready for that or give them tips right. what to do. But we, we have a couple of hard criteria. Um, when we look at a company, be it SaaS, it's slightly different for other verticals, but um, revenue and um, in, in Europe or some European markets, there for us, the magic benchmark is if they have uh, 1 million ARR, um, or going really fast towards that. That can also be the case. So if they have very strong growth rate uh, month on month and we just see, okay, within two, three months, they will be through that threshold. So it's not a binary threshold, but um, something that we look at and or enough funding to actually fuel the expansion because otherwise we make a plan, mm. no chance to execute. Yeah. Sometimes we make the plan in order to get the funding on board. So that's a different case. Um, and also the number of, of FTEs, how many people work at the company. Um, if it is just like um, three, three co-founders and one intern, it might be way too early. So if it's around 15 people at least, so late seed stage, then I think it starts getting interesting. You need to have a scalable sales channel, sales and marketing channel in your home market, traction in your home market. If all those things are not in place and sometimes we hear, we got to go to a different market and then educate that market because there will be our market. 
debatable. So if you cannot make it in your home market or at least get first traction, that is an early indication that um, yeah, you, you're not ready yet and mm -hmm. you ha don't have product market fit in your home market. Um, so that that's where we cut it and say like, hey, maybe come back in, in, in half a year. Here are five things that we see that we that could help you. Uh, a couple of people that we can connect you with, um, but it doesn't make sense yet. Mm. Yeah, although on that home market bit, like I think it depends where your home market is, right? Because yeah. some markets may just be a bit too early, right, for a particular solution. While in other markets, it's already kind of wildly accepted. I'm thinking of my kind of home market, although I live in the UK, right? But I'm originally from Poland, so I know that certain solutions are taking much longer to kind of become widely accepted and adopted in Poland, even. Yeah. You know, I, I chatted to a friend about such a simple thing as um, uh, take to go, you know, coffee, right? <laughs> that, yep. did, that didn't used to be a thing in Poland until, you know, a few ways ago, um, a few years ago already, right? But one of her friends like opened the first like um, to go coffee shop. And at first it wasn't going anywhere. It was like, it was horrible. Nobody wanted a to-go coffee, right? <laughs> so, so the classic yeah. example of being too early in the market, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, Do you so we, sometimes handle cases like that when you tell a customer that, hmm, actually you should be in a different market? Yeah, every now and then that can happen, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. depending on the maturity of the market. Um, th but there are certain things that are just universally true, right? Um, for, for companies, if you sell to them, especially in the B2B space, um, then, then they have that need anywhere. But yet, yes, there are different maturity levels in terms of digitization, how open are people for it? So what we often recommend is you need to test the market or find a good learning market to see, is it different in another market uh, than your home market? Give you an example. Uh, the Netherlands are a really good testing market for pretty well advanced um, solutions because digitization is, is on bar with um, the UK, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, mobile payment is, is very uh, prominent here. So it's, it's quite developed. And from a cultural perspective, Dutch people tend, tend to give you very straightforward feedback. Mm. So, so they say yes or no, and you will hear it. So uh, you living in the UK, that's a different case, right? So yeah. You have to, to read between <laughs> the lines a little bit. Politeness. Yeah. So, so if you ask maybe someone in the UK and say, what do you think about my product? That person it's might say, interesting. It's, it's interesting. Thanks for showing me, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, versus in other markets uh. where there's a more direct feedback culture, you will get our feedback within two, three weeks. I totally get it about the and, Netherlands. I have the same experience. Like people are super yeah. direct. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And that is worth so much because it saves you time. And so it's like, okay, cool. Then um, what should we improve and how can we improve our product? Yeah. Um, yeah, totally. I know we're kind of running out of time. So just like one last question, which is a big one though. Do you have any like go-to tips for the audience to take away if they are considering you know um global expansion like what should they think about before they even like you know consider it or contact you yeah um be aware that other markets uh, are just different it, it's easier said than than really live it um so be aware of it be aware of cultural differences um this is key in any marketing sales process but also internally how you build up your company you will have a very international team sooner mm -hmm. or later hopefully that's fun but it also um, provides a lot of uh, pitfalls that you can step into or fall into so be aware of it all of that is a bit like learning a new language um, it, it adds something to your personal skill set. So um, be, be aware of that. Reserve time. Expansion is not something that you do on a Friday afternoon. It's really a full time job and um, it's also hard to delegate. So, as a CEO, as a founder at that stage, you need to be involved in it. Mm -hmm. um, also, your shareholder will, will want to have you there or otherwise find someone who is senior enough to, to take that on um, and and just go for it with a, with a plan and iterate on the plan. I think that's something that I see very often, have a plan um, hypothesis, test it in the market and then roll it out and, um, and, and 
and scale your company internationally. It's very rewarding. Um, it helps to work with experts and local people on the ground that really understand that, that yeah. can save you years. Um, and I think the last one is build up the organization in the right way so that it can support that whole international um, expansion, find the right people. We often help in that uh, to make the cultural match for country manager with the organization, because again, that might set you a year back or even longer if you have the wrong person. So that would be it. And for the rest, have fun and succeed. Gotcha. Wow, I like that. I like, especially the testing part. I'm a big fan of testing everything yeah. and MVPing everything before you know you kind of go full blown project. Awesome. Thank you so much for for you know this chat, Gernot. I'm sure you know our audience will find it super valuable. Um, you know, a gentle reminder: use the pilot. Also allows you to um, localize your in-app experiences and in-app content. So any you know onboarding flows, tool tips, etc., into over eighty languages, like with one click with AI based translation, then then a good translator, you know, can review and tell you if it's if it's correct. And so yeah, I think there is a lot you know that we could still collaborate on, um, apart from this interview. Um, but yeah, it was it was super interesting to hear an expert, you know, go through these questions with me today. Yeah. And yeah, we'll definitely chat again soon. Thanks, Emilia. And maybe one last offer to the to the people mm. who will see it and your your future and current clients. Hit us up for a free consultation for 45 minutes and we give you feedback and spar with you on your go-to-market and expansion questions. So I'm here, uh, my colleagues are here, and we're happy to provide feedback on that. Brilliant. Thank you so much.